and we can go ahead and kick off the conversation with some introductions. Cool. Well, uh, I'm excited. This this is Dayton Mayor Nan Whaley, and uh, we've been talking about uh, different groups this uh, idea of racism as a public health issue that came out of actually County Commissioner Kevin Boyce in Franklin County, and um, uh, he had been sending it around. And so we were planning on doing, I think, this conversation uh, even before this, and Amaha stepped in to really. Uh, push us to make this happen. I want to thank him and thank everybody else that's been doing this this work and conversation and how we can make it meaningful in Dayton, I think is really what we're interested in too. Jeez, not, just, me help you. not just declaring it, but uh, making it meaningful. So it's good to be here. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us, you know. Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe I'm gonna make the commission going to introduce us first and then, then we can introduce ourselves and then go forward. Great. Chris Shaw, Dayton City Commission. I'm Matt Joseph, Dayton City Commissioner. I'm Daryl Fairchild, Dayton City Commissioner. Okay. Uh, Maha Slasi, uh, Sociality Professor. Uh, Heather Holland, Mental Health Counselor and uh, Social Commentary. Shannon Isom, YWCA Dayton. Michael Cardona Jones, Faculty, Sinclair Community College. Rinki Goswami, a new doctor. And, um, hey. and hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ryan Ivory. I'm a licensed social worker, and I am the uh, Region 7 Director for um, the National Association for uh, Social Workers, the Ohio chapter, and Montgomery County is part of Region 7. Yeah, good thanks. Uh, good thanks for everybody for coming together. And I, I appreciate, you know, uh, when everything kind of comes together, because, you know, uh, Mayor Whaley, everybody ha had been having conversations, Sandy's been having conversations, Heather pulled a group together to have conversations. So everything's kind of been, uh, been coming together. I want to see if we could possibly, I think we're at this moment because of the tragedies of, uh, you know, Ahmaud Aubrey, Brianna Taylor, and, um, uh, George Floyd. So I want to see if we could take a, a brief moment to pause to, to honor that um, and then move forward. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm thankful and excited to kind of have this conversation to explore the possibility and to see what, what it means in this hour during a period of of immense transition, right? How do we uh, develop some lenses and language or, uh, to kind of guide how uh, transformation happens? Um, I, I I think uh, I wanted to share something briefly. So we kind of put together a proposal, but I wanted to kind of lay a little bit of the groundwork uh, first and then pass it off to, to Myla to talk about the proposal. You know, so like we know race is a social construct, right? That uh, there's no genetic marker or anything that, that delineates race. Um, but I think what we're talking about now is exploring like how do we, uh, you know, race was constructed when white was constructed, right? We said like, this is what it means to be white. And then that in turn determined what everything else meant, right? And at one point in our history, it meant that, you know, white was human and everything else was inhuman, you know, be it African, be it Native American, Chinese, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think we're talking about developing an anti-racism lens. You know, we're talking about really how to come to back to the acknowledgement of, of everybody's full, full humanity. Um, and by making it a public health, um, you know, by seeing uh, racism as a public health issue, right, it provides a lens to be able to attack it from the multitude of angles of social determinants of health. But I want us to actually look at the structural determinants of health, right? Because oftentimes when we're looking at social determinants of health, we're looking at the outcomes itself. So we're looking at food deserts and education issues and uh, you know housing and everything. And th those are actually like fruits or outcomes of policy decisions. And so I want us to look at like how power actually works and uh, the definition of power that, that I've been using, which is, Power is a way to describe a set of relations between and among people, taking space within historical context and social structures, right? And so uh, within that framework, looking at like how decisions are being made 
and how we can develop uh, an anti-racism lens, right, that can be used uh, in policy decisions, to be used to explore like how our structures are, are formed now and how they can be organized later. How can resources be organized in a way that, that, uh, that do an anti-racism um, lens? Because I think the key is that structures aren't neutral. Right? We, we make this assumption that like, oh no, the structures are, are neutral, but actually they're, they're not because structures are ideology plus resources. So I have an idea, then I add resources to it and that's how I build structures or like institutional arrangements. And, um, and historically, like so redlining, for example, right? So redlining was based on the notion that, you know, white was safe, right? White was healthy and pull our resources into areas that uh, were labeled green on the redlining maps and you have blue, yellow, and red. And at that point, you know, the definition of white was small so that if you were, you know, Jewish, Italian, uh, uh, Polish, Irish, these things did not apply to you. You were not considered white at this time, right? And so, um, so that idea was then given resources, meaning that if the area was green and fit the slim definition of white, that you know it was safe to invest, it was safe for banks to put money in, it was safe to, to live in. And then at the delineated out, like less and less resources went into that area. So that's how like the structure was created based off an idea, right? And so I think like right now, it's like, how do we decenter that idea, right? And to an idea that acknowledges the dignity of worth of every human being, right? And then codifies that inside the structures themselves, right? So that like policies and the lens that we're using to make decisions uh, is is based upon that. Because right now, because of the uh, the way things have been set, the, the structures have unequal outcomes. That's why, you know, minorities always end up on the bottom. And it's not a thing of like, oh, people are intentionally doing it. It's, it's kind of like this letting the system go as it is and not addressing the underlying issues that are, that are keep reproducing and sustaining uh, inequality, right? Um, so I think with that, I'll pass it on to, to Myla to kind of talk about, you know, I'm a sociologist teacher, so I apologize, but, <laughs> but yeah, if I uh, pass it on to Myla to kind of uh, talk about uh, today. Thanks, Maha. So I think it does help kind of set the tone and create the foundation for what we really want to discuss today. Now, we put together a pretty lengthy proposal, and we recognize that we're not going to have time to go through all 18 pages of that today. So I don't want you to think I'm about to read that to you. <laughs> we, did, we did put together an outline um, to address and to kind of get us uh, on, on point for today. So, you know, we all came together, you know, you've got a PhD, you've got a sociology professor, someone who's really active in the community. I'm a JD, so I'm coming at this from the perspective of laws, um, Ryan, who's our social worker, and Rinky, who's the MD. And so we all brought our passions into this one document. And so our hope is that, you know, we're able to really align our goals also with goals that are already and initiatives that are already happening in the community. And now really, this is an effort to bolster the work that's already being done and to address the issues that are not um, in an effort to make sure that as a community that we are, you know, really seeing the change and being the change that we want to be and certainly serving as a model um, as a community that you know, gets it done. So our overall proposal really has nine critical variables that we believe are directly influencing public health um, from the perspective of racism. So the first one is just that overall understanding of institutional racism, those social norms that really need to be addressed and broken down. And we need to provide that information to the public so that they're aware of what some of those things are. Uh, many of us have discussed some of the conversations that we've had you know, with friends and other relatives and some of the things that they don't even realize as institutional racism. And we need to have those very difficult conversations and continue having those with the community. Equitable healthcare, we all know that that is a huge challenge, not just in this community, but you know, statewide and on a national level. So really addressing some of the ways that we can um, look to what our doctors are doing, what our nurses are doing, ways that we can incorporate additional training um, what are some of the reasons why African Americans specifically are not getting the health care that they need? From an educational standpoint, um, looking at vouchers, the No Child Left Behind Act, um, you know, why our schools are lacking in certain resources that provide them with the opportunity to, you know, really have more, you know, advances. And um, really, we need to get the Dayton Public School Board on, uh, 
on board with this as well. And so I do want to pause for a second because we recognize that some of the initiatives we have are not just on the local level. We definitely are going to need the partnership of the county, of the state, and all the other entities that are involved in order to get this work done collectively. Yeah. Um, looking at economic opportunities as number four. Number five is really um, divulging the law enforcement, both on a county and city level, talking about um, some of the neglectful public safety efforts and also addressing the work that's already being done. So, you know, Mayor Whaley, you've already started with your five step um, points and we think that that's great. And we actually think a lot of the things highlighted within the proposal um, can really help bolster some of the work that is already being done in the community. So then we have the local criminal juvenile um, family courts um, really working to uh, address some of the behaviors to meet survival needs. Uh, a lot of times when our youth especially come into these court systems, you know, yes, they're, they are assessed, but, you know, is there a need to do more? And I think that all of us, if we're being honest, we can say, yes, we can absolutely be doing more to address these needs at a root cause so that we don't see our youth continuing to, um, you know, enter into the court system. And then as adults, they continue. So we know recidivism is extremely high once you get yourself into the system. Um, from an environmental standpoint, we're looking at racism, gentrification, redlining, all of those structural racisms that are happening in the US system, housing systems. I mean, these are deeply rooted discrepancies in our neighborhoods and they absolutely impact the conditions and the way people live. Also addressing food apartheid, I feel like I shouldn't even talk about that. That should be a mob because he is the man when it comes to that. Uh, but we need more than one gym city, right? We need to fully address the desert that is going on in West Dayton. Um, that is obviously as a direct proponent of some of the disparity in health that we see amongst our populations. And so we really need to address ways that we're going to get healthy food and viable options into those communities. And then hate crimes. Um, and so at a level, you know, first of all, in the state of Ohio, there is no exact hate crime. Um, there is an intimidation um, statute that allows you to elevate certain charges, but really addressing, I mean, what, what is a hate crime? What does that look like? And what are the ways that we can um, in, infiltrate that into our legal system so that people recognize the importance of, um, you know, the work we're doing and that we're recognizing that a lot of things are happening as a direct result of people hating on someone for the color of their skin, of their skin simply. Um, so those are kind of the nine critical variables. And again, the proposal goes even further into all of those points. Our goal for today though, I think what we really were hoping was to kind of establish three things. So first, just outright declaring racism as a public health crisis at a local level. I think, you know, we're at that point, it's time to do that. Um, obviously, this allows the city of Dayton to begin breaking down each area that is going to be addressed in that proposal and anything else that comes along the way. And that gets us moving in the right direction because, you know, it becomes racism becomes a community issue. Right. Right. Um, second goal, establishing a local anti-racism task force to address and further assess the needs going forward. So we recognize that there are already task force in place. Um, they're gonna need to be many more implemented in the future, but what this kind of local anti-task force can do is focus in on moving the needle as every single force addresses anti-racism through that lens and, and keeps that as the forefront, right? So this is critical work that's being done. Um, we know that the name of the game going forward is gonna be capacity and it's gonna take leaders responding in a coordinated manner. So if we're not on, this, on the same page as what does anti-racism even mean? What does that lens look like? You know, then we're still kind of working non-collectively. So I think that that task force will help us be cohesive in that manner. Um, and then kind of in the same vein and similar to the efforts that are being made in Akron, Ohio, having a five-year equity plan would seem to be an appropriate way to kind of address all of the steps that we want to take in the right direction. And then finally, you know, working closely with county and state initiatives, addressing the emergency and in aligning these efforts, I think that it also, you know, sets Dayton up for success as we're preparing for, you know, potential funding that may come in and additional resources that are going to be needed. Um, as this is potentially going to be declared at the state level, we know that they're working actively to make sure that that happens. So I think by going ahead and you know making that declaration, that puts us in a position where we're well prepped 
to uh, align ourselves with all of the initiatives that are going to be going on at that level as well. So that's just kind of a, a high level overview of the many things that are outlined within that proposal. Um, and I know we also have Shannon Isom on the call. I wanted to hop in real quick before before. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I want to just make sure that uh, can we talk about the context? I, I think the part of the reason for changing the language is that it, it enables a different type of conversation, right? And so it's, it's like, you know, as we change the language, then as we explore, like, what does that actually mean? It, it shifts the context and enables uh, all the various partners in the community to be involved in uh, the conversation. And the one thing that I forgot to mention in the beginning that I really wanted to highlight is that, like, we understand that like, this work is work that we are standing on the shoulders of people who have been doing this work for a long period of time, you know? I mean, like for real, for real, like since 16, 19, right? So, so it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a long work and it's been a long struggle. And, and I want to acknowledge, you know, all the local work and national work and that like, you know, that we're standing uh, here today and even within the city, right? HRC has been doing uh, this work for a long time too. So I, I want to acknowledge all, you know, that, that I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that, like we're here in this moment because of all of this work that, you know, that we're standing on right now, including Shannon's, right? So, so yeah, so that's what I'm sharing. I think that's my cue, right? I can go, <laughs> thank you. It wasn't the best pass, but yeah. Yeah, oh, that's good. <laughs> Hi, Commissioner Mims, I'm glad to see you as well. Um, I, I just wanna certainly not belabor um, um, but underscore what, what Myla has already outlined beautifully as well as, as the team. I just want to add to a context. I think that um, we're familiar faces here, so this conversation isn't new. But I do and I want us to, to look at this time and moment very differently. And I'm asking that would be added to this is that the city would take it upon itself to catalyze and activate spaces around leadership to build capacity. I, I very strongly know and believe and have seen and Nan and Chris and Matt and Jeff, you guys have been here long enough. Daryl, you've been here long enough to know that we have multiple committees and you guys have probably sat on them and there is a difference than the committees and then how do we execute? So my concern is that we're gonna add committees we're going to tokenize this work itself and maybe even other the work. And I think with this outline, what it should do and what I would like to do is really, really help build what capacity looks like mm -hmm. and how do we build leadership in a way that activates the space that allows then the city, the county, public health to really look at these measures and look at them in a multifocal point, which includes money. How do we get money in here, um, which really looks at state partnerships um, and then really does, and, and Myla said it beautifully, and then stacks on that local efforts that we are doing. So um, I wanna add to that. I think that's the work that, that I love and, and certainly what I would wanna do. So in saying that, um, I've just talked a little bit about the YWCA is doing just to give space. Um, the first city that ever declared um, racism as a public health crisis was the city of Milwaukee in Wisconsin. And that was done by a 35 year veteran leadership CEO of the YWCA of Milwaukee where one in every three black men are jailed mm -hmm. or in some type of penal system. So we have then now that we're on our fourth and here within our state, we have Franklin County due to the efforts of also the YWCA with collaboration of not Columbus, but Franklin County saying that this is a health public health crisis. And now we've seen others. So we've seen Akron, we've seen Canton, Toledo, um, we've seen Cleveland. All of those YWCA CEOs are at the table and what we're doing is building a library that synergizes efforts so that we don't have to duplicate them, synergizing language phrases. What we also know is that we are also building a good platform of what we know are the issues in the state of Ohio. And so because of that, not only am I very um, interested in the efforts that we're doing locally, but I am I'm asking the governor along with Amelia Sykes as well, that this has to be a state effort joining with uh, 13 other CEOs in that space of the YWCA saying the exact same thing, also inclusive of the boards. We would be the first state. I think that is, 
that is phenomenal. And I would love for Dayton to be a real powerhouse part of that ask. What I'm also doing though, and what we've done, I've talked to the CEO of YWCA St. Paul, that, that George Floyd was an active participant. They knew him well. He was part of their programming. I've talked to the CEO there as well as the YWCA Minnesota who's had to close down their childcare due to the protests. And they were serving in a childcare for essential workers and responders, much like we see in our community. And I've asked them to take that language that we're compiling and ask their governor, who I think is really readied in a lot of ways to have this conversation and let's make this a multi-state effort that we're joining hands and really in tandem doing that. And I would ask Nan that maybe if that is something that you could do in collaboration with other mayors within those exact same communities and then reach out to the state of Wisconsin because we know that the least there is one real um, force there in Milwaukee. So I think that we can look at this in a, in a multi-state effort. I think that it could add value to not only our capacity, but it won't make us feel so alone and doing the work and onerous and especially as quickly as things can get siloed in our community. So I would like to, again, um, add to that and add capacity, um, funding, um, multifocal approach and um, also very much to build a library around our capacity and potentially be a place in which others can look to see how it's done. Mm -hmm. And I think the other piece of this is, you know, obviously we came in, we made this proposal, but you know, we're not aware of everything that's going on in the local level. And so we also are thankful to have the opportunity to just have this discussion with each and every one of you all to see, you know, what is being done and how we can align these efforts. And, um, you know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. If there are already practices in place that makes sense that, you know, we can bolster some of this work, you know, that's what we're here to do. So um, the, the next steps would definitely be, I think those three goals with the additions from Shannon, and then also to just see how we can best align going forward. Yeah, yeah, I think like, to me, it's like how do we, you know, utilize collective impact, but utilize collective impact towards, you know, developing an anti-racism lens and anti-racism community and how different sectors can come together in, in, in this effort, you know, because there's so much momentum right now, but like, how do we, how do we actually do it? And I love the idea of the library because I think that's part of like, like, like how, how we build our local capacity is by more people that are educated on, on, on language and how to do it and how it works and doing our own work right because we can't really do this work in the community if we're not doing this work individually first and i know i have a lot of unlearning to do myself right and so it's like you know we've all kind of been struck by the disease i can't speak for anybody else but i'll speak for me you know what i mean so it's like you know like like you know continue this process to, to truly learn what it means to acknowledge the dignity of every human being you know so maybe uh uh, we could just open it up for, you know, discussion, thoughts, feedback, uh, if anybody else wants to share that hasn't spoke yet or, you know, just open up the floor. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's other folks that want to add to this that are on it, like Rinky, Ryan, or Heather, do you have things you want to say about the, the proposal? Um, so for me, um, I was really listening and, you know, hearing about doing the collective efforts uh, locally as far as, um, you know, statewide. I wanted to mention that a lot of the research resources that are in the proposal, uh, though lengthy, have been uh, uh, gathered from um, local, national, and even international resources. So these are things that have been um, researched and uh, evidence, scholarly evidence, uh, that worked uh, currently as far as um, historically. So looking at the historical perspective, which Amaha was talking about, um, right with when we talk about the redlining and the vouchers and, and all those different things, understanding um, where those words um, and where those ideas come from, I think is important for us to be educated on as a group, um, not just so we can have the verbiage, but we can have an actual um, complete and competent dialogue. I think this is example of diversity, right? When someone says that word, it, it, uh, it creates many visuals for many different people, right? And I think that's where a lot of times sometimes the, uh, the messages or the education gets lost um, in the fluidity of those things. Um, 
but I would like to see the work that's been done, uh, some of the research that's been done already. Um, just for me, that's, that's something big. I love the library idea. I think that it, along with creating the libraries, we need to, like, I think what you're trying to get out of Maha is archiving mm -hmm. um, some of the work that we're doing, you know, passing the, passing the torch, more so passing the manuals for those who, you know, coming behind us, because this has to be the work that has to keep on going. I see. I think Ricky wants to say something about you. Oh, yes. Um, so not to compound one crisis with another, but as you guys all know, we're in the middle of a pandemic um, and COVID-19 has absolutely disproportionately affected communities of color more than any anyone else. So um, my big question, especially as a new physician, is how we're going to work together to kind of mitigate the second wave that's incoming. Um, and that's that's one of my biggest concerns that I would like for us to discuss if possible. Uh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, uh, I was missing something. Ryan, do you want to say anything? I've lost your screen, um, so maybe not. Um, well, I'll, I'll start and just make a couple of comments, and then would uh, would love to hear the comments of the commissioners too. First, I just want to say thank you. Uh, putting together an 18-page pay, uh, paper on what the challenges are in our community. Uh, which are, uh, when it comes to race, is immense. And um, I know that took a lot of time and a lot of effort. So I want to say thank you for that. We'll make sure that when on our social media channels and channels, we share that with the public so they can see that. If you all are okay with that, I see head nodding. So uh, we can really have this discourse too about that. Uh, and I think your all's point particularly about this work that I think of the nine points made in the paper, I think the city of Dayton has direct touch to a third of them. And so there's no way if uh, this very powerful body, the Dayton City Commission said this, we would only be able to deal with a third of those. So we know we have to engage more of our community partners. Um, and that's, and quite frankly, that's um, a challenge too. I think we need to be honest about because there is an education level for all of this that we're, as we're all learning through this, that we all come in different places in this. And so making sure that people get to um, why this is so important is going to take the work of all of us to do. So I'm committing to that. I think that we really need to have um, uh, an effort on this that is bigger than just the city of Dayton, right? So Dayton will be committed to this. I I'm sure I would be surprised if all commissioners showed up and so they didn't wanna do this uh but but we have to we have to broaden that work and when you talk about an anti-racism task force there are conversations all around the community right now and i know amaha's in some of them and shannon's in some of them and you all are probably in some that i'm not in um but the ones that i that i see and hear and i think too we have to do some work on these task force to get them to say the word race like we need to right uh yep. and i think just I know that sounds like a small bar, but Amal has been in some of these conversations, oh. right? Like saying yeah. the word race is going to be really key in this work to call it and to name it as the issue. Yeah. And so I, I'm telling you, I'm personally committed to that work. We have to um, make some folks feel a little uncomfortable in this in this work and or a lot uncomfortable. And so I think that's really important because I do think there's tables and they need to name it. And I think those tables, once they name it, can be transformative in this issue. Okay, so I think that that's a really, really important part. There is work underway for an equity plan. I would, again, I think we really need to like call it like a race equity plan and, you know, uh, really start pushing this now in this opportunity to make transformative change about how our community and its leaders think about this. And we have to start using words that matter and they do matter in this. And so um, I think those those things are very, very very do doable and um myla your your point about working with the county and the state is so very necessary and, and the schools right because when we think mm -hmm. of this public health issue um the public health system is countywide so we appoint some people and the county does so they're key in it but it's again not something that we ultimately have control over and frankly you know there are many African Americans that live outside the city of Dayton now, so too. So, you know, we have to get other jurisdictions engaged in this. 
um, else we're not really doing anything for our community as a whole at large. And um, that's gonna that's gonna be some serious work too that we need to do. Uh, I wanna I just wanna point out a couple of things that this commission is committed to. Uh, Milo, you mentioned the work that we're doing around police reform that we announced last Wednesday. That's key, obviously something we, we as a city in Dayton public, Dayton police have a lot of control and authority over. But I do think we have to talk about the county sheriff here and other jurisdictions in this work because um, we've had issues in all places. And so really calling that out, I think is going to be important. Not, not, I mean, I want everybody to work on our stuff. So, I mean, it's kind of hard if I'm saying like also because we're gonna need a lot of help on ours, but I think we have to re recognize that too. Uh, secondly, Commissioner Mims has put together really a West Dayton Recreation Working Group. As we've talked about how we're transitioning around recreation, which is a race issue and, and an equity issue in our community. Uh, most of the children that we serve in recreation youth services are African-American children. What does that look like? We haven't looked at it for 15 years. I know Commissioner Mims will talk more about that. So I'm not gonna take all of his thunder there. Um, and he's working with Commissioner Shaw on that. We, we also did the eviction task force. That was again, you know, recognizing that um, women of color with children were the most affected by evictions. And so how could we really do that work? You know, we used a race lens there for that and are continuing to do state advocacy around some of the things that we can't control uh, that can be controlled by the state. And then we put together last year, this neighborhood housing conditions team uh, in partnership with Bloomberg Harvard to figure out, uh, you know, we have significant, because of redlining, we are still dealing with redlining in our community. And even though it was outlawed near, you know, 50 years ago, it still has effects in Dayton and so where do we go from here? And these are, these are questions that cities like Dayton, Albany, Syracuse, uh, Buffalo, Rochester, um, Lansing, you know, we are, all, we are all working on this because we haven't fought, solved those problems, but we still are working on that with a group and have put significant capacity of that. And then again, the work that Commissioner Mims does um, around men of color and My Brother's Keeper initiative, as he's led that in partnership with Dayton Public has been I think key of that. And then, you know, wow. the, the big issue is the big the thing we've, you know, been committed to as a as a city for decades is the Human Relations Council. And the work that they do and have done uh, all through decades has pushed some of these issues. Um, and I think there's opportunity to really uh, figure out ways that um, things can be continue to move through there. And I know many of you have served on that board and, and or serve in some capacity there. So those are the things that we we see and we look through, particularly around um, uh, this issue about racism as a public health issue that the city is pushing. And I'm sure there are more things that we can do. Uh, we have talked as well with uh, public health, Dayton, Montgomery County, about having a city county table around public health. And so I think that that's really important. Again, they have looking everything through an equity frame. I think, again, we should you know, say it should be a race equity <laughs> Uh, uh, frame and so yeah. I think we just need to start doing that work uh, and calling on that for our community leaders to do right and I think there's a great opportunity for that here uh, Shannon you talked about the state and national effort the Ohio mayors we're on a call nearly daily for, because of COVID for the past you know 80 90 days I think nearly every city on that call the seven cities Dayton Akron Toledo Columbus Cleveland Cincinnati and Youngstown will be passing this declaration uh, they're all going different ways around it because some want the council to do pieces and some, you know, everybody has their own processes, but we have started talking about that um, uh, uh, nearly 10 days ago about this. So that will be acted. Uh, we had a call yesterday with uh, Representative Sykes, uh, Leader Sykes about this as she tries to move this through the legislature, which is very difficult. Again, the Ohio legislature, um, I don't know if they, well, I'm just going to leave it alone. Uh, anyway, that's going to be very difficult uh, uh, to, to move through. And um, uh, we support her in that effort. But she did say that she was getting people from across the aisle that are interested, which is heartening. And oh, one is the beginning. One is the beginning, uh, Shannon. Uh, and ho hopeful. And there's things, again, that this community can do. Again, as we talk about this being a regional effort to call on those legislators, because except for one, 
other uh, Republicans, there's opportunities to ask them as well in our community. We have to start making people feel uncomfortable about this issue. Right. Um, yeah. And we have to start having um, those really tough conversations with our leaders. Um, you know, we, uh, we really, I, I know people might not believe this, we welcome that at City Hall, we do. Uh, we appreciate it and it helps us grow and we have to we have to require that for other parts of our community as well so uh, we're committed to that um, I'm gonna let the commissioners speak uh, I've gone on a bit but I wanted to just kind of talk about all the things we're doing how they fit on this uh, public health issue uh, uh, lens and this work around around race and um, I'm really, really grateful for you all putting so much time and effort to this because what we did not want to do is we did not want to pass something and then it have no meaning. Mm -hmm. And I think what you guys mm -hmm. have done is to make it, okay, here's what the meaning of this is and here's the actions that we can work on in our community. So I'm gonna move through the commission if it's okay, Amaha, and start with Commissioner Fairchild and move up through seniority if you're okay with that. Yeah, that's great, yeah. Okay, Daryl, you're up. Thank you, Mayor, and I uh, want to thank you for your comments and for all um, Amaha and the team for bringing this forward. Um, I think just three quick comments. One is, Mayor, I appreciate you talking about the importance of how of being able to speak candidly about race and forthrightly, and that's going to be very important. Having said that, um, I've done enough race relations over the years to know that um, there's a recognition of what is now being called white fragility. Mm -hmm. And so for many whites who are able to live within a world where they don't have to uh, be impacted by issues of race um, daily, or in many ways, only when they choose to, whenever they have um, encountered this, they get a little bit of distress. And because they're fragile in this area, they will react in very defensive ways. And so I think it was um, Shannon Isom who um, acknowledged about creating space. And so part of our work will be to create that space so that whites can be brought into this conversation in a way that we they can recognize that distress, be a little bit uncomfortable, but be taught the skills to be able to overcome that distress and remain in the conversation. And so I think that'll be a really important um, part of the work that we do together. So actually, I think I only had two things to say. <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks, Daryl. Yeah. yeah. Those are important yeah. points, Daryl. I appreciate bringing up particularly the issue of white fragility. Uh, as, and I do think, and I think that probably goes, you're probably fair to say, it probably goes with some of our leaders in the community as well, that they have that. So we have to be thoughtful about how, how what the end game is here, right? So. Right. And I, I mean, I, I would say white and black, right? Because I think some black are afraid to, to, to press the issue for fear of like misunderstood or consequences, right? So I, I think it's a holistic thing of like, you know, we kick the can down the road, but like what's the generation that's gonna actually like take the stand that like we heal the intergenerational wounds? Because like if I, if I harbor these things that I pass them on to my daughter and then she passes them on to her kids, you know, like, like what's the generation that can take the stand, right? And and move the needle. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mary. And thank you, everybody for, that's online uh, doing this work. Um, I, I know that it is very important. And uh, I must apologize, first of all, because I have not seen the 18-page um, document yet, and I look forward to uh, reviewing that. But my question had more to do with, uh, I think, process. Um, it seems to me that there was a table being set for gun violence as a public health issue. And I think, I think at least in my own mind's eye, I was thinking that that was more around a funding model. Um, some others may be able to tell me differently if, if that were kind of at that table, which I was not. But I guess my question is, um, process-wise, uh, are there some lessons to be learned from that table that was set for gun violence as a public health issue? Are there some best practices that came out of that or are coming out of that that we capitalize on, you know, as opposed to, again, reinventing the field? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Shaw. Uh, the gun violence as a public health issue is still not quite fully formed, uh, particularly as far as the table being created. So as far as like best practices yet, I don't think that we're going to learn much from there. 
I do think though there are other tables that are in place that could really take this work and, and move pretty quickly because some work's already been done. And so I think there there's opportunity there, uh, particularly on this issue. And I do think um, public health uh, has been doing some good work. I mean, really pushing, uh, I know through COVID as Rinky brought up the COVID issue, I don't think any call we've been on that they haven't brought up the, the um, disparity on COVID and have called, even went to, um, when one of the early test sites were in Kettering, I know their chief medical officer went to Kettering and said, this shouldn't, you know, they didn't have say over it. This shouldn't, what shouldn't be here. This should be in, in the location where there are disparities. So they have been doing that work. Um, so I do think there's opportunities there. I also think uh, the gun violence one, you know, and I believe it is a public health crisis as well. It is not nearly, it doesn't touch nearly as many places as this one will. And so I think that this will be much more broad and we'll have to use our leadership and all different tables to really yeah. get this. Yeah. No, I completely agree with that. I, I guess where I was headed with that um, is that there has to be some kind of mechanism. You test on this. That there have to be, um, it has to be very inclusive and broad based. It can't just be city of Dayton. It has to be the county and the right. city and other municipalities in order to make this work. So, you know, I, I guess um, I think you answered it, that the table is not fully been set for gun violence as a public health issue either. But all of these issues, race has a touch in every single one of these issues, including workforce and jobs and everything else um, that we do around here or try to touch. Um, so, so, so I get that and, and I appreciate you for saying so, but that's where I was headed with it. There has to be a way. Certainly, the city of Dayton can't fund much of this ourselves, frankly. And uh, we got to make sure that we have the partners at the table that are going to be able to drive these things forward. Uh, and that obviously begins with a countywide conversation with certainly the state and everyone else. Uh, just, again, thank you for doing this work. And I know this is very <coughs> cursory. We're just getting started with this, but if there are other models that we can kind of build upon. Um, that would be yeah. preferable, not that we just have to do the work um, on our own. Yeah. So as, it's interesting you bring up like uh, gun violence. I, I appreciate you you bring that up because, you know, a, as a researcher that like race is like the underlying issue or the underlying sickness that's pervasive throughout all, 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 all society. And segregation has been directly linked to gun violence, right? And so like there's a lot of data out there like linking zip codes and a whole, whole bunch of things to, to higher propensity of, of gun violence, right? So like, I, I think it I think it it fits. And I'm hoping, you know, it's perhaps that like, this momentum can then help solidify the other tables that are, that are necessary because they're all kind of outcomes of race, right? So so like how we can like lay that foundation and build off of it. Good point, Amaha. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Shaw, anything else? No, 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 go right ahead. All right, well, I wanted I to go. address, go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't want, want to quickly address uh, Commissioner Shaw, and I, I uh, know that you haven't been able to look at the, um, the full publication, um, but when I speak about gentrification and residential segregation, I do touch upon, um, I don't say gun violence specifically, but I do talk about different uh, violence um, that we are dealing with in, in certain segregated areas and the historical context, the reason why those are, and then I actually, actually also have plans of action, so it's not just um, at sort of like the city or local level, like we as a, as a group really have put in um, work plans of action, models that have already been uh, proven or evidence to be uh, formidable. And those are all, along with the resources um, to be contacted or to utilize, those are all within the, in the plan of proposal. Thanks, Senator. Thank you. Commissioner Mims, I know has been uh, dying to say a couple of things because I've heard him ready to pipe in so and as i named him a few times commissioner mims well you know i've, I've uh, probably been around for a couple minutes in terms of addressing some of these issues and um, uh, while it's painful to see the symptoms of the problems that have not been resolved over the decades um i don't know if to say if it's somewhat gratifying that we see this fine people moving together at least right now to be at least more aligned uh, to address this issue. And, and that goes back to one of the things you said, I'm, I'm certainly in, in a concert with moving uh, with this action towards the, the health issue, certainly. Uh, the alignment is, is, uh, is important. 
I think the issue that was mentioned earlier, again, in terms of uh, the collective input, in terms of how we make some of these things happen, because they're affecting every one of us. You know, we cannot do these things without addressing the word of race. And so many of us, again, including myself, sometimes we are cautioned to use that word for fear of alienating some of the individuals that we need to resolve this issue, or these issues. Right. Because we cannot, as African Americans, resolve these issues by ourselves. <clears throat> we certainly didn't create these issues. We don't have the control, for example, uh, at one time when I was a, um, um, a lobbyist as well as a human rights type of person with the school system, and working in those areas where we saw the and, and training processes, those individuals who were white who made $55,000 a year because of the interest rates they were getting on homes and cars had the buying power of African Americans who were making $75,000 a year. And it was 70% of those. It wasn't just 10%, 5%, and things of that nature. The, the involvement with the Supreme Court ruling on school funding, now more than 23 years old. And when you have four Supreme Court rulings, and you also have a common police court ruling uh, before that, that says primarily the way we fund education in Ohio has this most negative and adverse effect on urban and rural communities. And yet we can't get it fixed. And the reason why is we've gone through a myriad of meetings, um, uh, again, collectively over five or six years of dealing with that particular issue. And like I said, those four Supreme Court rulings and then trying because we had the uh, merits determined, trying to get that to be moved to the U.S. Supreme Court to get a decision there. You, you probably would not be surprised at how many individuals, politicians, primarily Republican, went to bat against the Supreme Court hearing that particular uh, case because they did not want a remedy. They did not want a remedy for that particular issue. So even when we look back at that issue in terms of funding, how it affects young people, the educational piece, which I'm gonna talk about the recreational piece as well because it's connected to that, because all these things are quality of life issues. And when you change that bell curve that says the children at the lower end of the spectrum are predominantly uh, poor and white and black. And the ones at the top end, predominantly, uh, of course, white and affluent. And, and those individuals are concerned that when you begin to give adequate resources, that bell curve begins to level out. Mm -hmm. And it creates another perception that the black kids now are smarter than we have given them credit for all these decades. <laughs> so. When school systems are fighting, if you will, to get proper funding and the testing craze, which we also know based upon data, has again, the most negative impact perceptually on African-Americans, especially African-American males. And when you take away things from the community and the school system, because cities that are poor, like, like Dayton, Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati, we also find ourselves in a situation where we have to cut those kinds of things that people seem not to have the value for. Therefore, we make reductions in recreation. We have cities and schools that make reduction in their athletic programs, their music programs, their art programs. So going to school gets to be an issue for young men, in particular, black males, who say, I'm tired of taking these damn tests every day. Now, and they're saying some things a whole lot worse than that. But I'm just letting you know that that's where they are because you've taken the fun out of school for not just the kids, but also for the teachers, but also for the principals, and certainly for the parents. And we all know that schools and communities are linked together. Yeah. And when we, when we struggle with the, the men of color, we had strong support six years ago with leadership in the school system. Mm -hmm. And since that leadership change, it's been a serious struggle to get the school to accept the fact that the men of color my brother's keepers program is not an educational program as much as it is a social program exactly. however the social program 
creates educational results. Yeah. And it's hard to get them to set aside their efforts on testing and to get others to set aside their efforts on testing and all the other kind of accountability factors to say, well, all the research says clearly high achieving school districts across the nation, high achieving uh, vibrant communities and cities all have high quality of life opportunities that include recreation, music, art, all the kind of things that we all enjoy seeing. And when you don't provide those things, there's no surprise that we get exactly what we have right now. And even when we have those type of situations where we have the shootings and the unfortunate um, uh, death of George Floyd and others that we've had across this nation, when you already are traumatized and angry, you know, it's just a, a, a powder keg just walking around looking for a flick, a spark, or anything of that nature. And that's what puts us in the situation that we're in right now. So, uh, so again, I mean, and I can go on, and, and, and certainly you know I can, those who, who know me, but the passion <laughs> is there for all of us to do the kind of things that we need to do. And I've listened to everyone who's spoken so far, and, and you're right in line. You're right in line with where we need to go. And the, the, the last thing I guess I'm gonna stop with this, uh, I was at a meeting earlier today, I guess it was full of the, uh, a vigil for parents who have lost children or sons through gun violence. And one of the things that, uh, and, and, and Matt was there, which is, um, Joseph was there with me as well. One of the things that was very painful is that there's still this confusion with, with regards to who do we wanna blame? And there's also this confusion of how do you vote to get out of this? Mm -hmm. And we have African-Americans giving confusing messages about voting Democrat versus Republican and looking at just not because you know someone or just because you heard the name a couple of times. Certainly we have to look at those issues and those candidates and their record and the history and the credibility that they bring to the table. But there's so much focus on who to blame and they're just almost in some cases indiscriminately throwing out rocks. Now those kinds of things makes our job much more difficult. And when you see a case such as the Supreme Court case on school funding that has not been resolved in 23 years, you have some people saying, what's the use? They know they're doing it, they know it's wrong, but they continue to do it. So I'm gonna stop right here. Well, we, we appreciate your uh, history and understanding of it. And I, as you can tell, Commissioner Mims touched on a whole wide pieces, which your paper does as well. So uh, thank you, Jeff. Thanks for your great mm -hmm. leadership. Mr. Joseph, we're short on time, so I know you'll be brief, but wanted to give you a chance to say something as well. I'm the right commissioner for the job, I think, Mayor. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, first, I want to echo what the mayor said and thank you all for putting this together. That's no easy task. Uh, I know that you all are some of the most busy people in the city, just like we are, and to find the time to put this together and brief us and plan for this, we really appreciate it. Uh, it, it, it thank you very much for the work you put in. Uh, from a practical standpoint, uh, the mayor said this, I want to echo it. This needs to be broad based. Looking at the example of the task force that was put together when we declared opioid, the opioid crisis, a, a public health crisis, uh, that task force was effective. It was very broad based. And uh, we found synergies where we didn't expect. Mm -hmm. Like we had uh, the county and the city working together, the health department, the city, our fire department working together in ways that we didn't expect and they were very helpful and they, they made a difference. We had our firefighters together with somebody from public health going together to houses, individual houses to talk to folks. We didn't plan that you know, before, but it was an out to the table and everybody putting resources in um, and making it happen. So I think that that may be, uh, Chris, Commissioner Shaw, you mentioned that might be the model we follow, at least at the beginning. Also, that's something that the county and some of our other partners will understand it gives us a framework. It gives them a framework for understanding where we're coming from and a starting point. Great point. Uh, so I think, Mayor, I agree with the point there and uh, I, I, I echo that. Uh, the I second agree. thing is um, that uh, we mentioned briefly funding. Chris mentioned that it's gonna be hard for us to do a lot because things are, things are bad. Um, but I think that with the new administration, God willing, in January coming in and their focus on this, I think that we may want to start thinking about ways that we can suggest that new administration how they could spend their money in this area. Um, and if we have a model together 
a frame we're ready to accept. You made the point, I think, Mila, on a state level, but I think we can even think federal if, like I say, God willing, we have a change up there. And I think it, uh, we we may want to make sure we're ready for that if it will come to to that the influx will come. Um, and finally, uh, I haven't been around as long as Commissioner Mims has, and I appreciate his experience, and I look forward to hearing more about it uh, one of these days. But I will say I've been around long enough to recognize that this is a special moment. This is something that doesn't come around very often. Uh, you mentioned this is a generational thing. Um, so I, I really appreciate you all working together with us, uh, bringing this to us. Uh, let's, let's grab this and take full advantage of this moment, right? Um, I, I think now's the time. So thank you all for, for your hard work. I really do appreciate it. Thanks, Commissioner Joseph. Um, Amaha, do you have any closing comments as our leader in this work? Right, uh, I, I'm thankful for this dialogue and, and the discussion. I'm real frank, thankful that uh, the concept of white fragility got brought up. I think that that is like the underlying issue that that we have been taught not to have the race conversation, and oftentimes like people talk to do, talk about everything but race. And so I yep. think ultimately part of the challenge is how do I how do we see race and still have equality, right? Because oftentimes we 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 minimize race, right? We're scared to talk about it, but like, how do we acknowledge, oh, you're black, but you're still a human being and you're still, you'd be my friend and this, that, and other, you know? And so I'm encouraged um, by this work. And I, I, I think like this can be a catalyst to allow these things to emerge. Cause kind of like uh, Commissioner Joseph had mentioned with uh, with uh, dealing with the opioid crisis, right? Like, like once you kind of create the space and you allow the emergence, you allow all the ideas and the capacity and the gifts and talents of the community to come together to tackle this issue. And one thing, if we haven't learned anything else over this last year, that like our, our community is ready. You know what I mean? When it came to the tornado, when it comes to the gun violence, it's like, like, like we continually show up, you know what I mean? That's just who we are, you know what I mean? So I know we're gonna ride to the occasion. Well, thank you, Amaha, for your hopefulness and your leadership. And thank you to everybody on this call. I know we'll probably have more conversations and more calls. I think this was a great one, a great starter. Uh, I, I'm assuming we will put it on calendar in eight days. So it will be on next Wednesday's calendar. Uh, and then um, we'll, we'll, we'll already get to work before that. But I look forward to, I think these conversations, Zoom, the, the time of COVID allows really deep conversations <laughs> on Zoom anymore. And um, I think we should do this again in the future as we talk about different places that we need to move. So I want to thank you all for that and appreciate it. Thank you for, for, for allowing this space to happen, you know, like we would appreciate it. Oh, no, it's awesome. I appreciate you all and uh, you all have a great evening. And thanks for thanks for all your work on this. Um, it, it, it really means a lot to us and it'll make a difference in the community. Okay. All right. Have thank a great evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye.